Are you okay? Yes, it looks like I can okay. record, so we're good. Excellent. All right, wonderful. All right, we shall begin then. We're always happy to welcome Professor Sergio Laporta back to our lecture series. Our speaker is a staple of the Holocaust and Genocide lecture series. We depend on him to provide an explanation of why the Armenian genocide happened, what ramifications it had for the Armenian people, and why its recognition as a genocide remains incomplete in 2022. Dr. Laporta received his BA at Columbia and his PhD at Harvard, working in Near Eastern languages and civilizations. He was a lecturer in Armenian studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem before he settled at CSU Fresno, which sponsors a very broad program of Armenian studies in the midst of a very large Armenian community. Professor Laporta is currently the High and Isabel Berberian Professor of Armenian Studies and the Permanent Assistant Dean at CSU Fresno. Welcome, Sergio, again. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. It's great to see you. Um, I wish I were with you in person, and hopefully next year that'll be the, uh, the case. And I will uh, try and, and present this introduction to the Armenian Genocide um, focusing on the theme of persecution and political identity uh, this year. Um, I realize we have a slightly different time format uh, for the class this year, and I'd like to leave uh, enough time for questions. Uh, so I'm going to move through uh, my presentation. And today's goals uh, really uh, consist of um, introducing you to who the Armenians are, um, providing a history of the Armenian genocide, um, how, it, uh, how it unfolded and its ramifications as Ben noted. And then finally look at uh, how persecution has impacted contemporary political identity. And by this, I mean how Armenians tend to look at themselves in their own history and within their current geopolitical uh, situation because the genocide has had a huge impact on, on how they view their current uh, situation. Again, in the time uh, permitted today, I can't go in depth I'm happy to talk more about it in, in, in the question and answer session afterwards. Um, so let's start off with who are the Armenians. Some of you may be familiar with Armenians and mainly through food. Um, here are some of the favorite dishes. I, I think that you can see there pilaf, kebab, uh, dolma, and uh, lachmajun. Uh, but more, uh, more concretely, we can see Armenians um, today live in this uh, area here. This is the Republic of Armenia. Uh, just to the um, west of Azerbaijan, east of Turkey, south of Georgia, and north of Iran. Um, and obviously with the uh, events happening currently in the Ukraine or in Ukraine uh, uh, with the Russian invasion, these also have an effect in Armenia. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that uh, at the end as well. But from even though this small uh, bit of territory is the uh, current Republic of Armenia, historically, the lands of what we call historical Armenia or the Armenian provinces in the 19th and 20th century, and the Armenian habitation of this area goes back much further into antiquity to 3000 uh, BC. We have here the, the, the main Armenian provinces of the Ottoman Empire, uh, plus uh, those Armenian uh, provinces that were then and in the 19th and 20th century part of the, uh, of the Russian Empire, but this entire area was the historical, I would say, and also going over into the governorate of uh, Elizabethpol um, and a little bit north into the uh, governorate of Tiflis. This entire area was the historical, the central historical location of Armenians throughout history. Uh, and it, they also settled in, in the area by the Mediterranean Sea known as Cilicia, but this always remained uh, the heart of uh, uh, sort of the, of the Armenian homeland. And if we look at some significant factors of Armenian self-identity, the first one would be a long history. As I mentioned, they, they trace themselves back sort of in legend uh, to Mount Ararat that you can see here. And after Noah and the Ark, uh, the Armenians are, are thought to have settled uh, shortly thereafter in the uh, Armenian plain. Uh, but we do know that there has been a long um, and continuous inhabitation of this uh, area for millennia. But they are aware of having a long history going back uh, into antiquity uh, all the way up to the present. Um, and then secondly, uh, a major factor is their Christian faith. Um, they're very proud of the fact that they were the first nation to accept Christianity at the beginning of the fourth century. 
Now, they weren't the first Christians, but as an official um, state, they were the first one to accept it as the official religion of the country. The king, King, king Tirdat, converted um, in the early fourth century, making it that the first country to make it its official religion. They have their own church. Uh, it's known as the Armenian Apostolic Church, and the head of their church is known as the Catholicos, the equivalent of the Pope for the Roman Catholic uh, Church. Um, they have their own language uh, that's been spoken uh, again for over two millennia, and they invented their own alphabet in, in 406. So this is the all the capital letters, what we would call the capital letters. There are 36 of them, and each column here represents a, a uh, one of the number series. So this would be the ones column would start off in the upper left-hand corner, then the tens, then the hundreds, then the thousands, and each one goes from one to nine, nine uh, 10 to 90, et cetera, et cetera. And this alphabet invented in 406 is still in use today. There are some slight modifications, but it's still the one uh, that's used by our meetings today. And then finally, we can talk about a homeland dispersion part of their identity from, for, from the earliest existence of Armenians, they, they did travel outside of their homeland that we saw earlier um, and had what we would call dispersed communities in, in, in other places. But they always had a sense of the, where their homeland was and where they hearkened from. And this has continued into the present and particularly after the genocide when we have a diaspora where they were forced into this uh, emigration throughout the world. Um, and that also plays into how um, they view uh, their own history. But we'll return to this uh, towards uh, the end of today's talk. So let's now turn to the Armenian genocide. And first, I just wanna start with some basic facts of the genocide. Um, it's commemorated on April 24th every year. And that's because on April 24th, 1915, 250 um, Armenian intellectuals in the Ottoman Empire were arrested uh, and most uh, were soon murdered uh, thereafter. Uh, between 1915 and 1923, approximately 1.5 million people were killed, 800,000 in the first four months. So that's a rate of 200,000 a month. And that uh, you may have heard already is the same number uh, that occurred in Rwanda. Uh, the, the speed with which genocide occurs um, is one of the most difficult factors uh, in trying to prevent it. And it occurred in the Ottoman Empire under the direction of the ruling Committee of Union and Progress known as the CUP, uh, that was the name of the party. We'll, we'll get to this a little bit later, but it was still the Ottoman Empire. Um, the, the Sultan had been removed uh, but, uh, and had been replaced uh, by, uh, uh, by a parliament, uh, but the Committee of Union and Progress soon took power and um, imposed martial law on, 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 on the empire. And the other thing is that we should remember that uh, the genocide is a defining moment of Armenian history, but I'd like to emphasize that it's not the defining moment. Armenian history, as I mentioned, is very long. The genocide does have an important uh, role in how Armenians think of themselves today, but they did have a long history before the genocide of cultural production of political agency, and they continue to have one now and will continue to have one into the future. However, one of the more uh, painful aspects of the genocide is of course that it is denied to this day by the Republic of Turkey, as well as by the Republic of Azerbaijan. We'll talk about them a little bit later who deny that a genocide happened. They have various uh, other claims as to why the Armenian population of Anatolia or of, East, of, of, of Turkey of the Ottoman Empire disappeared within that short span. Um, I'm happy to expand upon that in question and answer session as well. So on the positive side, although it's re rejected by the Republic of Turkey, it has been recognized by the International Association of Genocide Scholars, the International Center for Transitional Justice, the Ely Wiesel Foundation for Humanity, the European Parliament, the Council of Europe, the World Council of Churches, 32 countries in the Vatican City, and now also the United States. Um, the both both uh, houses of uh, Congress have approved the recognition of the Armenian Genocide, and, and President Biden also mentioned uh, the Armenian Genocide um, uh, publicly, thus sort of um, bringing, at the time, Great relief to the Armenian community, particularly in the United States, but around the world as well, um, formally uh, acknowledging that a genocide had occurred. Um, and here you can see that in, in, in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Armenian genocide, um, the Fresno Armenian community and Fresno State partnered to put up um, an Armenian genocide monument here on the campus of Fresno State. 
Uh, it's the only one of its size uh, on any campus that I can think of in the, in the country. In fact, uh, we're very proud of it. Um, and uh, Armenians come and, and visit the, the monument every year. And we also hold commemorative ceremonies there every year uh, on April 24th. And the last, and you know, at, at one point, the most positive, I think, aspect where Turkish scholars who are re-examining their past also have recognized it. Uh, so even though the, the official line of the Republic of Turkey is that the, there was no genocide at all, there are many Turkish scholars uh, as, and, and, and non-academics as well who have re-examined their past and noted that, no, this indeed was a genocide and it's something that we um, as citizens of the Republic of Turkey have to come to terms with. Uh, unfortunately, that has not made its way up uh, to the upper echelons uh, of, of the government. And we should also recognize that the people killed during the Armenian genocide or what's known as the Armenian genocide were not just Armenians. Um, a large number of Assyrian Christians uh, were also killed. Contemporary reports record between 200 and 250,000 were killed in southeastern Turkey and the region around Lake Urmia in Iran between 1915 and 1923. And it could be possibly as high as 400,000. Uh, and, and that was about over half uh, the population uh, of the Assyrian Christian community of uh, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and we have many uh, survivors here in the Central Valley, uh, particularly in Stanislaus and Turlock um, uh, of Assyrian Christians who, who also uh, commemorate their genocide every year. Um, and then there's also uh, the Greek uh, genocide uh, where again, the numbers are unclear, but they range anywhere from 450,000 to 900,000 um, uh, Greek citizens of the Ottoman Empire. Um, uh, were murdered, uh, and it was finalized even after the Ottoman Empire ended and the, the fledgling Republic of Turkey was set up. It wasn't quite yet the Republic of Turkey. At a catastrophe in Smyrna in 1922, where up to around 100,000 Greeks and Armenians uh, were killed. This is uh, a symbolic post um, postage stamp that was issued uh, having the uh, three uh, flags of each of the people who suffered. Uh, during this period around World War I, uh, suffered genocide at the hands of the, uh, uh, of the Ottoman Empire and the post-Ottoman uh, state. Um, and these were recognized, uh, both the Assyrian and Greek genocides were also uh, recognized by the International Association of Genocide Scholars in 2007 and by the Republic of Armenia um, in 2015. But how do we get, right? This is the big question. How do we get to the point where uh, a state uh, eliminates or attempts to eliminate an entire sector of its population. Um, and so just want to give a brief history. And of course, given the time that we have, we can't go in depth into the entire history of uh, Armenian existence in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, but we, we can note some high points here. In, in the early 16th century, uh, the Ottoman um, state that, was, that had started basically in, in Western, on the Western side of Anatolia, um, had, had spread rapidly and captured uh, what we know as Western Armenia. Um, at the time, capturing just meant that it was able to send troops there and they required tribute uh, from the various different um, city-states that existed in Western Armenia and from the Armenian population. Um, the empire, of course, grew and strengthened and solidified. Um, and in, during the 18th century, um, as uh, Constantinople, as a, as a, bub a bustling city, um, and a center of, uh, uh, of business prospects emerged, uh, many Armenians moved there. Uh, there had been an Armenian, small Armenian population there earlier, but it really burgeoned in the, in, in, in the 18th century as many Armenians moved from what was becoming a destabilized and a poorer um, rural areas of the Ottoman Empire to the east, decided to move west in order to seek their fortunes there. And they, they did well. Um, in the 19th century, we start to see a real affluent urban Armenian class uh, developing. These are people who are involved in all aspects of Ottoman life, you know, from, the, from directing the mint, uh, the gunpowder mills, uh, to um, holding uh, more uh, dominating trades uh, and, and money lending. Um, and so they became a, a vibrant part of uh, Ottoman economic life, uh, particularly in cities like um, Constantinople and Smyrna. They also start to develop their literature, their literary um, uh, tradition, uh, which continued to exist, but now flourishes in the modern vernacular that's being spoken in Constantinople. 
Um, they're engaged uh, both uh, with Europe and with Turkish elites, artists on both sides. And it's really, if you're looking at um, the history of uh, Armenian existence in the Ottoman Empire, around 1850 um, is um, probably the high point of, of their uh, of their existence. The certain reforms have been put into place. They're known as the Tanzimat by the Ottoman Sultan it, itself. The empire wants to uh, increase the standard of living across the board, increase transportation and education, um, and is looking um, a lot because of encouragement from European powers, uh, also uh, to create security of life and liberty and property for everyone. And so there's a big uh, I would say there's a very positive motion movement uh, um, occurring in cities in the western part of the empire, particularly in the major urban centers of Constantinople and Smyrna, such as these, um, uh, that uh, really seems to show a positive, bright future, uh, not just for the empire, but also for even the minorities within the empire. The Armenian provinces, those provinces that we looked at earlier, however, were a different story. And again, these are the six major provinces of uh, the uh, of the Ottoman Empire that were the that had Armenian populations, the heaviest Armenian populations. The mass of Armenians in these areas uh, were agricultural peasants. There were some towns and cities, but the vast majority of people were agricultural peasants. Right. The reforms that were being uh, promulgated in Constantinople, the capital of the empire, were not necessarily being implemented or enforced in these sort of more rural areas um, where it was more the local uh, rulers uh, had greater discretion as to whether they wanted to enforce them or not. And there was a lot of pushback um, uh, from the uh, local Turkish and Kurdish Muslim populations against uh, these laws that seemed to favor uh, Christian minorities um, at this time. And so at the same time, there was a sense of lawlessness and abandonment. We have letters from uh, this part of uh, the empire to Armenians in the capital, asking for the government to send greater troops into the region to restore order. Um, and many Armenians had to take up uh, self-defense uh, organizations, form self-defense organizations as um, uh, the Kurdish and Turkish tribal chieftains in the area would raid their property. And there was no sense that they would ever get their property back or that these people would be punished. Um, and so in that state of lawlessness and abandonment, they really look to the Ottoman Sultanate and, the, and the, what they call the sublime port, that is the court in, in Constantinople for assistance, and really didn't either because the court was uninterested or unable to actually restore any sort of law and order, um, were, were their pleas were not heeded. And the Armenians were a majority in, 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 in Van, and that's the, you can see this, uh, the province that is to the furthest east uh, of the six. Um, and they were a plurality um, in most of the others and a minority, but just barely a minority um, uh, in, 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 in one of them. So this is really the, where most Armenian, uh, most of the Armenian population of the empire existed. Um, and where the center of their traditional uh, life was. So as we move into the early 20th century, um, we see this bifurcation of life in the empire. On the one hand, things in Constantinople are uh, socially and economically looking fairly good for the, the upper middle class. In the Eastern part of the empire, it's not looking so promising. Um, and I have to say that it wasn't the Armenians who were the only ones who were um, tired of the, the, the lawlessness and the lack of ability of the Ottoman government and of the Sultanate. Also, other sectors of the empire were, um, uh, were frustrated. And we see in 1908, a coup against the uh, Ottoman Sultan, Sultan uh, uh, Abdul Hamid II. Um, and people saw this as a time of hope. Um, he's overthrown. Uh, people came together, um, Armenians, Turks, Greeks, Jews, um, came together and celebrated uh, the overthrow of the Sultan, hoping to establish a parliamentary form of government. And, and it was called the Young Turk Constitutional Government. Um, this was a mixed cabinet uh, and, and it was parliamentary and Armenians uh, participated in it. However, even from the very beginning, problems did lurk. And in particular, there, were the, there was a contingent of the Young Turks 
who were military nationalists known as the Committee of Union and Progress, and they remained dissatisfied. Uh, and the main part of the main reason for the dissatisfaction was that the Ottoman Empire continued to lose military engagements, particularly on the European front, um, as the European provinces of the empire start to declare independence. And this goes back into the 19th century with Greek independence. And then throughout the Balkans, we start seeing independence movements as, as these um, uh, fledgling nation states in some senses um, start to pull away uh, from Ottoman control. And the military nationalists are very dissatisfied with this and would like to put the uh, Ottoman military back on the front burner and have them be a more aggressive uh, part of the government. And in fact, they themselves launch a coup um, in 1913 to take over uh, the government. Uh, and the leaders of this coup are Enver Pasha. They're known as the, the triumvirate of the three Pashas. It was Enver Pasha who was the minister of war. Uh, Talat Pasha, who was the Minister of the Interior, and Jamal Pasha, who was the Minister of the Navy. Um, and in particular, um, Enver Pasha is very um, excited, I could say, um, to join in on the side of Germany with whom the Ottoman Empire was aligned uh, into World War I. And his hopes of joining uh, the German side in World War I and being involved in the war was to be able to uh, unite, quote unquote, all the lands uh, that were inhabited by Turkic people, not necessarily Turkish people, but Turkic peoples from the Pacific Ocean all the way across Central Asia into the Anatolia to the Mediterranean. And it was a, an ideology known as Pan-Turkism um, that stretched, uh, that idealized the recreation of this giant empire from the Pacific Ocean to the Mediterranean. The only problem was that there were non-Turkic peoples in between. Um, first and closest, I would say, would be the Armenian population um, of the Caucasus, but then you know, all of the other peoples in the Caucasus as well. But in any case, at the, in, in January of 1915, Enver, in the hopes of stretching Ottoman rule beyond uh, uh, the Eastern Turkish borders, leads a disastrous campaign against the Russians um, in which his army is slaughtered, uh, particularly at the Battle of Sarkamish. Um, and in, uh, and in, in his retreat, he begins to uh, blame Armenians uh, for uh, the loss, saying that they betrayed the, uh, the Ottoman army. Um, there's no evidence that Armenians uh, betrayed the Ottoman army. There were Armenians who fought for the um, for the Russians because they were in, as we saw before, they were in the Russian empire. They fought on the Russian side. The Armenians on the Ottoman side of the border fought in the Ottoman army, um, but there does not seem to be any evidence whatsoever at, uh, for a mass uh, sort of betrayal of the Ottoman army by the Armenians who were actually very patriotic um, and wanted to fight uh, for the Ottoman empire. And so this seemed to serve a convenient excuse to put into motion what was indeed uh, probably a plan that had already been formulated to uh, eradicate non-Turkic elements from the Ottoman Empire, and particularly the Armenians who had been in these sensitive um, key positions uh, within the empire. So soon after that defeat, uh, in February of 1915, uh, the order comes out to disarm um, the Armenian population. Uh, this was, they were then asked to stand down from the army. Uh, they were put into, um, uh, rather than fighting units, they were put more into um, construction battalions uh, where they would have to uh, basically dig earth, uh, create, uh, keep on laying down the tracks for the railroads. But they, in most importantly, they were no longer allowed to bear arms. This was also used as an excuse later to, um, to search uh, Armenians' homes. And if they found what would have been a hunting rifle, which would have been part of what most Armenians would have, in order to keep themselves fed, uh, they could use that as an excuse for violating the violating the law. Uh, so the the and that was the first uh, order to come down. Then, in April eighth, um, the the government uh, decided to deport the town of Zaytun, and Zaytun uh, traditionally was considered problematic or troublesome by the uh, by the Ottoman government. They and within Armenian uh, sort of history too, they've always had an independent spirit, didn't like being told what to do. Uh, they sort of acted on their own. Um, and so it wasn't by accident that the, uh, the Ottoman government thought that rather than saving 
the difficult, the, the terrain of Zaytun is very difficult. It's mountainous, narrow paths. So it's not an easy town to access militarily. They deported them um, uh, early uh, in order to remove that, uh, any, any resistance coming from uh, the people of Zaytun. In April, and then in April 19th, we start to see massacres in the Vaughan region. As we noted earlier, the, the region of Vaughan in the furthest east had, had the largest uh, it was the, it would, not necessarily the largest population of Armenians, but it was one where they, were the, they had the largest majority. Uh, and then on April 24th, um, they, they decided to arrest approximately 250 Armenian leaders in Constantinople, um, whom uh, were uh, uh, killed shortly thereafter. And of course, this was not by accident. They hoped to cut off the head of the Armenian population. Uh, deprived them of their thinkers, their artists, their priests were also involved. Anybody who could have stood as a leader of the Armenian people um, at the, in the capital was basically um, uh, arrested. And then, as I know, by 1916, over 1 million people uh, were dead and um, 500,000 were displaced. And by 1923, uh, 1 1.5 million, approximately 1.5 million Armenians had been killed murdered by, uh, the, by Ottoman forces um, through various means um, that we'll see in a second. But just to give you an idea of the impact it had on the demographics of the region, there are these two maps uh, that a friend of mine, Robert Hewson, um, uh, made. Uh, and you can see this is approximately the Armenian population density in 1914, where you can see the, the redness, the, the um, uh, stands for uh, how many uh, uh, Armenians uh, were in the region. And then we can see in 1926 uh, how the uh, population had basically been eliminated uh, throughout this entire area. Again, just briefly, you can see how it, it's nearly all red and then we can see how it, it's gone to beige or white. Um, so it, it absolutely uh, eliminated the Armenian population uh, from uh, its historical homeland in, in Eastern Turkey, Western Armenia. Now, um, probably in your class, you've talked about the paradigm of genocide. Um, and, and this is important to note that we're not talking about here a random series of attacks that happened accidentally as some denialists like to claim. There was a paradigm, they were actually set out and you can follow it fairly clearly. So before um, the genocide was perpetrated, and even to this day, Armenians were denigrated. They were depicted as a disease, as vermin. Um, to this day in the Republic of Turkey, a way to curse somebody is to call them an Armenian. That is, the person's not Armenian, but if you want to actually, and so they do this a lot with Kurds, whom they now don't, the government doesn't like. So in order to insult a Kurd, they, will, they, they refer to them as Armenians. Um, and then there was a pattern to the extermination once it started. Uh, men were gathered and held and then marched out of town, uh, shot or bayoneted, uh, sometimes to save on the bullets. Um, often they, they took them to two towns first. So they would take them from, to the first town and then they would ask them, they would have them right back home telling everybody everything was okay. Then they would move them and then they would kill them afterwards. Um, so first the men of fighting age primarily um, uh, were eliminated. Then elderly and the women, uh, the elderly women and children were also told that they would have to leave um, because these areas, it's often said that these areas were um, too dangerous uh, for them uh, to live in because of the onset of war. As you can see that they're in, uh, all these red dots are where were the major areas in which people were deported um, uh, or where they set up later concentration camps. Um, as you can see, they're well into the center of the country and they were surrounded also by Turkish citizens who were not deported um, the, uh, the way uh, the Armenians were. Uh, they were then marched through the desert to uh, Deir Zor along the Euphrates and along, they were stationed in concentration camps along the river until they got to Deir Zor that you can sort of see here at the bottom of the map in, in D6. Um, that's where uh, uh, we had a, a huge concentration of uh, Armenians, several hundred thousand, most of whom uh, perished as they starved to death in the desert. Um, and we can also uh, see that uh, it had simultaneity. So between April and August in 1915, the Armenians of nearly every major town and village uh, were deported. 
So we can see that there was uh, there there this was a process. It wasn't uh, an accidental or uh, a sudden uh, burst of anger or uh, or a, a single invasion. There was a process. It was thought out. It was planned, um, and it, it was executed. Um, Likewise, we can see the use of technology and organization to help facilitate it. The telegraph, which was recent then, was used to communicate uh, orders. The new railway, railway lines that had been built to connect the Ottoman Empire uh, with Europe into Germany were also used, but in this case, to send Armenians into the desert. So they would, they would pack them up in these cars, often making them pay for their ticket uh, to where they were going. And then in the middle of the desert, they would have them all get out um, and, and, and kill them. Um, uh, and so if they didn't die in the cars themselves, um, they, uh, they were killed uh, either uh, afterwards or they were marched through the desert. They had a special organization, that's what it was called, uh, uh, established whose sole purpose was the elimination uh, of the uh, Armenian population uh, of the empire. And then uh, finally, Armenians were gathered in concentration camps. As I noted, the largest one eventually became Der Zor uh, in, in, in the Syrian desert. Um, and I point out all of these things, as you can tell, these, all of these uh, uh, elements would later be used um, in subsequent genocides of the 20th century, most notably in, in, in the Holocaust. Uh, but uh, the, uh, this idea that you would harness the power of the state um, and of the latest scientific technology in order to eradicate uh, a population we see already here at the beginning of the 20th century in the Armenian Genocide. And likewise, um, we see uh, the legalization of the genocide. And what, what I mean by that is that the, the government itself created a legal fiction that what was occurring was a legal act and not an act of murder, but instead was an act of the state. And so particularly having to do with the confiscation of the territory and the property that the Armenians left behind. And so between May and December of 1915, there were a series of laws that authorized the deportation of Armenians and then secured and registered their property. And then they created an abandoned properties uh, administration commission. So what happened was that when Armenians were deported, they were asked to, they were told um, that they should make a list of all of their property and hand it over to a commission and everything was itemized and kept uh, and a copy was made and sent to the central government. And that list was there, they were told, so that when they returned, they would be able to get all of their property back. Now, what happened was they first created uh, this list of the properties. And then they said, if they don't return by a certain date, then all of that property Devol uh, devolves to the state. And so you could legally confiscate it if they did not claim the property back. And of course, they knew none of these people were planning on coming back. They had no intention of letting these people come back. Uh, so after they were killed and didn't come back to claim their property, the state then took possession of the property and then they created uh, another uh, commission that administered the liquidation of the properties. Uh, so that they could then uh, distribute it throughout um, uh, the other citizens of the uh, uh, of the empire. And according to Talat Pasha's own accounts, and he was found with a diary on him when he was subsequently um, uh, uh, killed uh, by an Armenian nationalist after uh, after the uh, World War One was over. He was killed in Germany. Um, they, according to his own accounts, they have this was the amount of uh, property that had been confiscated um, uh, in 1915, which you can see was a, a, a sizable um, amount of property. So we see this legalization, this legal framework that's created, it's a legal fiction, but a legal framework created in order to uh, perpetrate the genocide. Again, another uh, commonality that we'll find in, in, in later genocides of the century. And likewise too, the Armenian genocide in some ways was the first internationally recognized genocide at the time. Now, they didn't use the word genocide because it hadn't been coined, right? I probably learned the word genocide was coined by Raphael Lemkin based on his study of uh, the Armenian experience, as well as what happened to him and his family during the Holocaust. He came up with the word genocide. But prior to 1940s, the word didn't exist. And so we see here, for example, in this New York Times headline, policy of extermination. And we see in the various news reports, 
journalists uh, and newspapers trying to describe the enormity of what's occurring, um, uh, talking about uh, the atrocities, the policy of extermination, um, the annihilation of a population, um, is, uh, was uh, th as they were trying to come to grips uh, with what was going on. Now, the United States still had people in the Ottoman Empire because we were still neutral in World War I at that point. And so uh, the American ambassador, Henry Morgenthau, as well as American consul, consular staff and, and American missionaries documented a lot of what was going on and sent back important reports. And so nearly 200 articles in the, uh, appeared in the New York Times um, that talked about the Armenian, what was going on to the Armenians and how they were being eliminated, right? And then these consular reports also so informed uh, the, the American government and the American population of what was happening. And then Franz Werfel um, uh, wrote a bestseller called The 40 Days of Musadakh, which um, is a fictionalized account based on a historical event of a community that managed to hold off uh, Ottoman forces um, on, the, on, the, on, Mount Musa, on Mount Moses. Musadakh means Mount Moses in the Cilician coast until they were rescued um, by, uh, uh, by a French, uh, by the French Navy. Uh, so they, they eventually got out. But this became a very popular uh, book, was translated into many languages, was put on the index by Adolf Hitler. So he had it burned um, because he didn't like this idea of a minority being able to defend itself. Um, and it was going to be made into a movie, um, but the, the actually the Turkish uh, 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 foreign ministry uh, put pressure on the United States to put the kibosh on that. And so the movie was not made by MGM, uh, even though they had been prepared uh, to make it a movie. But in that sense, in the, in the 20s, the Armenian genocide was a very well-known event. And, it, and also as part of the internationalization of relief efforts. This was the first international relief effort and the biggest relief effort the United States has ever uh, undertaken. So it, it founded the American Committee for Relief in the Near East, which then became the Near Eastern Relief Fund, uh, which is still, still in existence. Um, they, between 1916 and 1930, the US raised $116 million of relief money. That's the largest um, relief effort ever uh, undertaken by the United States. And that's about two, it was $2.5 billion, I would say, in 2020 money. I don't know what it is exactly today, but probably around there, 2.5 billion. That's a, it was a lot of money. And the campaign um, was enormous and involved presidents, politicians, and celebrities. And I don't know if you can read this uh, particular cutout. It said, Babe Ruth presented one of his home run bats to Mademoiselle Nuvard Zeron Koshkarian, who will sell it to the highest bidder for the Near East Relief Fund. So we can see here celebrities, sports celebrities, Bay Ruth, you know, being involved. We're used to this now, having politicians um, and celebrities involved in, in relief efforts and humanitarian causes. But this was not the case necessarily um, at the time. And uh, the Armenian genocide um, therefore reached uh, a, a really international recognition. Unfortunately, between the Great Depression and World War II and the efforts of the uh, Turkish government, um, that sort of recognition and acknowledgement declined as we moved towards the, uh, uh, the middle of the century. And only, I, I would say, came back to the fore again in the last quarter of the uh, 20th century. Um, and finally culminated in the US, at least, recognition uh, just a couple of years ago. So how does this history of the genocide uh, impact uh, contemporary, I would say, Armenian political identity? That is, how do Armenians then see themselves um, in the world uh, today? Um, and one thing, you know, all political identities are constructed, right? We have to, it, it comes from looking back and, 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 and revisiting our past. And we always see them through the lens of the present um, and, and through the lens of what we consider important. So the, the genocide obviously had a huge impact on how Armenians viewed their entire political um, and historical existence. So, and this stretches all the way back to the fifth century when there was what is known as the Battle of Avarayr, which is a war that um, Armenians fought against the Persian Empire and which the Persian Empire had invaded Armenia in order for it to give up its Christianity and, and, and become Zoroastrian. Uh, a good segment of the population resisted those efforts and they fought a war and they actually lost at the Battle of Avarayr. They were uh, slaughtered 
Um, uh, however, in the long run, uh, Persia was forced to acknowledge the Armenians' Christianity and, and allowed them uh, basically to continue to be Christian. So may, we can see that the image in, in the, um, the general at that battle, his name was Vartan Mamagonian, and he became a major symbol, uh, uh, even today, of Armenian uh, resistance uh, to, uh, to attack from larger powers on the outside. And here I just gave two examples of depictions of the battle. And this, the first one on the left here is the Battle of Avaray in the manuscript uh, from the Matanadaran in, 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 in Armenia uh, from the 15th century, it dates to 1482. And on the right, you can see from, what is that? Almost 500 years, uh, 500 years later, um, a painting by a, a, a modern artist, Grigor Khanjan of the same battle um, uh, with Vartan Mamadonian here in the, in the center with his, uh, with his arms up and even here a priest uh, who was involved in the battle with a sword. But again, sort of exemplifying this Armenian resistance uh, or support of Armenian identity against uh, a foreign uh, oppressor as they see it. So this becomes emblematic and a symbol uh, for the, uh, from the fifth century to, to today. And it gets also viewed Armenian history then gets viewed as a series of episodes of foreign rule afterwards. So whether it's the Caliphate, which is um, the uh, Islamic empire, and then the Seljuk and Mongol domination, and then Ottoman rule, and then Soviet rule. The paradigm that gets set is that the Armenians are a small community that maintain uh, their own identity, their own language. Those Remember that um, slide I showed earlier, their own language, their Christian faith, right, their own history, their own story within these larger empires who, for the most part, you know, in this paradigm, don't like them, all right, so that they suffer under these uh, sorts of larger uh, uh, forces to give up their identity, but they don't, and they manage to successfully, whether it's uh, through persistence or through victory, to survive all of these attempts uh, to change them. Right. And then, of course, the the biggest uh, example of this was the genocide and Turkish denialism after that. Right. Here's the ultimate example. And what is then sort of understood is that all of Armenian history and particularly from the Seljuk and Mongol domination that starts in the 11th century, about the year 1000 or 1071, all the way there's you can see an arc that leads all the way up to the genocide, that this is the culminating sort of event of all of these persecutions that have happened, you know, since basically 451. Now, this is just, I'm going to say, one way of looking at it, and this is not the only way of looking at Armenian history, and not everybody will do this, but this is one strand that, look, that goes through Armenian political identity in the sense of seeing themselves within this framework of larger um, empires and peoples who are trying to force them to change their refusal to do so and their resistance um, to either giving up their, their identity, whether that is giving up their language, their faith, um, um, uh, or, their, or their history. All of this was then resurrected, I would say, most recently in the conflict with Azerbaijan over the region known as Nagorno-Karabakh. And there were two major wars uh, fought over this region, re region in recent history. The region has a long Armenian um, uh, history in terms of, of population of the Armenians living there. Um, but during the Soviet era was included, the region of Nagorno-Karabakh was included within the Soviet Republic, Republic of Azerbaijan. Um, and since the waning of the Soviet Union, there's been a tension whether uh, between the Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh and the Azerbaijani pop, uh, government uh, about the future status of Nagorno-Karabakh in which the Armenians wish to be independent and the Azerbaijanis would wish the Armenians just to go away. Um, and, and this led into uh, two major conflicts. The, the first one being uh, between 1988 and 1994, where we have um, the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, first votes to join Armenia. Uh, their hope was to be, um, I'm gonna get the map up here, sorry. Um, okay. So here's Nagorno-Karabakh. You can see there's a region, it's, it's slightly um, distant from Armenia. It's very close and they wanted, they voted to be united 
to Armenia to have this entire area go uh, to Armenia. Um, but there were, uh, and this also sparked a bunch of our anti-Armenian protests and pogroms in Azerbaijan. Um, thousands of Armenians were killed in, in Azerbaijan and more uh, were forced to leave. They decided to pack up and leave and somewhere 250 or 350,000 Armenians um, uh, wound up leaving uh, Azerbaijan either to go to Armenia or to other parts of to Russia and other parts of the United States as well. Um, in 1991, uh, Azerbaijan launched an attack with Russian support against Nagorno-Karabakh and also threatening Armenia. Um, however, the Soviet Union collapsed uh, soon after that, and Armenia and Azerbaijan declared independence from the Soviet Union. Um, and Nagorno-Karabakh likewise decided that it would be uh, independent. Uh, this then turned into a full-scale war uh, between Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan, um, in which the Armenians gain um, control of uh, basically not only of Nagorno-Karabakh, they retain control of Nagorno-Karabakh, but also some of the surrounding areas. And that's what you can see on this map here is in the darker beige. These were areas that after um, the first war that ended in 1994 with a ceasefire on May 12th, um, Armenians now controlled. And this was essential for Nagorno-Karabakh as it linked Karabakh with the Republic of Armenia, people were able to go back and forth. Um, uh, a road was built uh, between the two, uh, lots of tourism that went back and forth, lots of exchange between Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh and supplies uh, also could go back and forth. However, in 2020, um, uh, things changed when in September 27th, Azeri forces crossed that, the, the line of contact, that is where um, uh, the border had been and invaded. Uh, you can see this is sort of the line here um, that red line, they crossed that line of contact. Uh, they had much superior military firepower and Turkish support. They used drones, which seemed to be um, absolutely uh, essential in their victory. Uh, the Armenians were still basically using uh, conventional warfare. Um, they held out um, much longer than anyone expected. We think the Azer Azerbaijanis really thought that they would be able to run over uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, but they, they lasted for 44 days. Um, against basically what is often reported as against five armies as Azerbaijan was supported by uh, Turkey uh, and other uh, 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 and, and military equipment from other countries. And in November 8th, the town of Shushi, known as Shusha in, in uh, Azeri, was taken by the Azerbaijani uh, army. And that basically brought um, the conflict. It's not the official end, uh, but it, it basically brought it to an end because there was no way that um, the Armenians of, of, of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh could continue really have any hope of winning uh, once they lost Shushi. Shushi is, is the high ground uh, over uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. And from there, it's very easy to launch missiles into what was the capital or what is the capital, Stepanakert. Um, and, and so once, that, um, once Shushi was lost to uh, the Azerbaijani army, uh, a ceasefire uh, arrangement was brokered by Russia uh, and then signed by Armenia and Azerbaijan. There's still, and it, there were large, huge territorial losses uh, for Armenia. All, all these surrounding areas that sort of protected uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and linked it to Armenia were lost. Um, and we, it ushered in and has ushered in a series of crises that are still in existence. So there's a refugee crisis. Thousands of Armenians were displaced. Um, 100,000 uh, fled at the time. Many of those have returned um, to, to Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, but we still have a homeless issue uh, in, in the region. Um, and a lot of people who um, have, lost their, uh, have lost their homes and are now refugees in Armenia mainly, but not only. Um, we have a crisis of cultural heritage destruction. Um, so the uh, uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan has already destroyed Armenian uh, cultural artifacts in other parts of Azerbaijan, um, Nakhichevan, which is another province not linked to Azerbaijan and was historically Armenian, but which the Soviets had um, given to Azerbaijan. Um, so here there are destruction of Armenian tombstones. Um, we also uh, saw buildings uh, uh, bombed uh, during the war. 
we also have the erasure of Armenian sites in nagorno karabakh where they're saying that they weren't Armenian to begin with, but they were Caucasian Albanian. If anyone's interested, I can get into it, but it's much more complicated. Um, or they're, or, or, uh, they're just uh, destroying them outright. Uh, so there's grave concern that uh, Armenian sites uh, within the Gorno Karabakh and the territories that are now under uh, Azerbaijani control uh, will be damaged, uh, destroyed, or Armenians won't have access to places, their holy sites that they have been um, uh, going to uh, for the past you know, 30 years now, and of course, earlier in their history as well. Um, and it also ushered in a political crisis in Armenia, which is not wholly resolved. Uh, the government in Armenia, uh, that was unable to stop uh, the Azerbaijanis had been a new government um, elected on an anti-corruption campaign. Uh, the, uh, the prime minister, uh, uh, Nikol Pashinyan, has managed to stay in power, but his reputation has been harmed uh, by, by what happened uh, during the war and the government's loss. And, and it really um, shook, uh, I think, a lot the political foundations of, that, of the country as well. Um, at the moment, there, have been, there has been an application to the International Court of Justice uh, that the Armenians launched uh, against, uh, that Armenia launched against uh, Azerbaijan, saying that they're violating human rights. Um, and the International Court of Justice has, has ruled um, temporarily in Armenia's favor, but um, there is not a final resolution yet as to what, um, uh, what the final outcome will be. That's a process that's still going on, but you can go to the International Court of Justice website and it was a, a, a decision handed down in December um, that, that found that uh, Azer, telling Azerbaijan to desist uh, from its activities, its anti-Armenian activities. However, of course, um, in the past couple of weeks, uh, we've seen more ghosts of the past uh, with the invasion of Ukraine uh, by Vladimir Putin and, and Russia. And again, this calls into question the, the geopolitical I would say stability of, of Europe and, and um, the Middle East, uh, things that we have taken for granted for the past 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union, of the world order that has been constructed in that, um, in that time. I think the movement of Azerbaijan against Nagorno-Karabakh was actually, you know, people, there was some attention paid to it, but nowhere near the amount of attention as, be, as being paid to Ukraine. Uh, while that on the one level, that is understandable. On the other level, I think people fail to recognize, as many people said then, that what is being done in, 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 uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh is a sign of a more dangerous world to come, where again, war was being used to settle a dispute that was still being um, negotiated within uh, the international courts uh, and through peace negotiations and one in which the international community proved unable to really do very much, um, or either unable or unwilling to do very much uh, against Azerbaijan, particularly because of oil um, and gas uh, uh, connections that countries in Europe had with Azerbaijan. We now see a similar sort of predicament happening uh, with uh, Russia and the Ukraine. And so it, it, I think it sends a warning that we need to pay heed to what is sometimes considered smaller conflicts in places that we don't necessarily seem to be, or we don't think to be integral to our own national interests, but see them sometimes as, a, 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 as indicating a troubling measure of where the world is going, just as the Armenian genocide um, was a troubling indicator of how um, new nation states were going to take care of what they thought of as problematic um, elements within their society through their eradication. Uh, just as much as the Armenian genocide sort of was uh, pointing toward in that direction, and that was ultimately ignored. Likewise, I think what happened with Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh was a sign towards the use of military force as a way to um, really go back uh, to the 19, uh, 1990s, 1980s, 1990s, and push the clock back um, and, and put the international community on its back foot rather than its front foot. But I, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I saw some hands go up. Um, during the lecture, and um, I'm more than willing to answer those. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. We certainly enjoyed another rendition of this very dense lecture and very informative. Anyone who has a question, could you submit it through the Q&A function, and we'll be happy to ask Sergio. 
We're accepting all questions now. Sergio, when the uh, subject of the Assyrian and the Pontian Greek genocides come up, do the Turks tend to respond with a similar excuse or answer of there being, it was a time of war, they yes. were engaged in battles and that these were just war crimes or acts of war and they couldn't be helped and it was and by no account a genocide. Right, they do not accept that the what happened to the Assyrians or the Pontian Greeks was a genocide. With the Pontian Greeks, it's also a little bit more complicated because there were population transfers uh, of, of Turkic peoples and Muslims from Greece in the Balkans um, and, and of Greeks from Anatolia, um, they were swapped um, and that created really, um, I, I would say un, unwelcome situations on both sides um, having done that, but that was one way of trying to resolve this sort of ethnic issue, but they do not consider the, the, the murder of the Pontian Greek population uh, to be a genocide, if they talk about it at all. I have to say, I mean, uh, the Armenian genocide is often referred to as the forgotten genocide. Yeah. And it's true that, um, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in comparison with other genocides since then, it may not have the same sort of name recognition. Um, however, uh, I could say there's even less recognition of what happened to the Assyrians and what happened to the Pontian Greeks, I would say, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an actual level. And in that sense, the Armenians have been very fortunate, uh, quote unquote, I don't like to use that term, but have been successful in getting um, their story told. I, and, I, and I think they should be you know, proud of the fact that they've been so successful in, in doing that. The Assyrian, I don't, I, I not heard a, a Turkish response to the Assyrian genocide at all. I don't, they've never been wow. forced to really, I mean, I could be wrong on that, uh, but I have not, I'm sure they deny it, but I don't think they've ever been forced the same way as they have been with the Armenian genocide to really speak to, to these other ones. Thank you. Are there any documented references to the Armenian genocide by anyone in Nazi Germany uh, yes. demonstrating planning the Holocaust? Yes, we do have, I mean, there's not a, a lot, but because the Germans were um, allied with uh, the Ottoman Empire, we do have a couple of instances in which German soldiers who were stationed in the Ottoman Empire during World War I wound up being concentration camp captains in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were able to use their experience of what happened to the Armenians as sort of a, a compass in some ways, an amoral compass in that way. And likewise, uh, Hitler himself was aware of what happened uh, to the Armenians. And in fact, when someone questioned him as to whether people, wouldn't people care if they you know, want to eliminate the J Jewish population of, uh, of Germany and of Europe and of the world, and he is, he is reported to have said, who after all today remembers the Armenians? Yeah. And, and because by that time, by 1939, the Armenian uh, case had been readily forgotten, had been forgotten to a large extent, where it had been very well known in the, in, in the 20s. By 1939, it had been largely forgotten. So it was a calculation he thought that could be made that, yeah, you may take a hit now, but in the long run, it won't matter. What does this denial of the Armenian genocide say about Turkey and Azerbaijan's political status internationally? And why did it take the US so long to recognize the Armenian genocide? Sure, uh, excellent question uh, as, as, as the previous ones were. Um, so I'll try to remember it. So for, for, for Turkey and uh, for, for Turkey first and foremost, denial of the genocide is wrapped up with the self image. They just really do not want to be associated with having committed an atrocity uh, such as the genocide. There doesn't really seem, they, there are also, the other thing associated with that is that you have to remember that the population of Turkey has been told there was no genocide now for decades, for, for 100 years. Um, and I know a lot of Turkish historians who want to push the case of the Armenian genocide, that is, have it acknowledged precisely to to highlight the fact that the government has been lying to the population for 90 years. And their point is that Turkey cannot have an actual true Republican government unless 
right? That the his, their history is, is addressed and they speak truthfully to their own people. And therefore, uh, they realize that the government is paranoid, is really afraid of having this recognized because it would undermine whatever they now say, because everybody will say like, well, for, that means for like nearly a century, you've been lying to us or for a century. Um, and so I think that that's where their greatest fear uh, rests in their, in their recognition. For Azerbaijan, it's a little bit more complicated um, in that uh, it's because of their relationships with Turkey. It's because of um, the, the current government of Aliyev, which is a dynastic dictatorship, um, the current President Aliyev, his father was the president before him, um, and, and it's basically a dictatorship. One of the ways they stay, stay in power is by breeding animosity against Armenians, right? And so when things become problematic at home, they're able to blame Armenians as for why, you know, Azerbaijan isn't even greater than it is. Uh, according to them, and that really the, they 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 have these ridiculous statements such as you know we look forward to the day when uh, all Azeris will be able to to vacation in Yerevan you know as one of their major cities um, when the land of our ancestors will be returned to us and, and it's all complete nonsense um, and Azeri identity in and of itself or Azerbaijani identity in and of itself is a very complicated issue. Um, uh, as well. But nonetheless, they, it would seem to be a more self-serving uh, interest in promoting racial hatred in order to prop up a, a, a dictatorship. Um, as for the United States, why it took so long um, is because Turkey is a NATO ally. Uh, it's a member of NATO. Uh, during the Cold War, we have, a, we have army bases there in Oljik. Um, and we also have radar station. NATO has a radar station um, on, on Mount Ararat that is poised towards what was the Soviet Union. So as long as Russia was a, and the Soviet Union was uh, sort of an antagonist of ours, we felt that Turkey was absolutely essential to the overall dominance of the US political order. Um, similarly, it was considered a an Islamic state that as a model for having a state in the Middle East that could have a democracy without having uh, a, a religious bent to it. Uh, that was not quite an accurate assessment in many ways. There is a, I mean, there is obviously, I mean, Ataturk tried to quote unquote modernize Turkey and, and secularize Turkey. And so he became very popular in the West. He was the first um, uh, president of the Republic of Turkey uh, after the Republic was established and is the forefather of, uh, of the state. His picture is everywhere. But he outlawed the Fez, he made people wear suits, um, he, 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 he pushed the education system, equality with women, he tried to modernize uh, the state. Um, and part of that was then also pushing the past um, behind it, including the genocide. Um, it was that this has nothing to do with us. We want, this is not who we are. We're, we're European in that sense. And, and because of that, many people in the West were also willing to overlook um, what had happened because they thought it was in their greater interest to promote a sort of a Western secular democracy in the Republic of Turkey that could counteract uh, Russia. That hasn't worked out as, as well as we have planned in many cases, but that was really the, the I would say the, the greatest um, hesitation on the United States part, uh, but clearly, you know, we did recognize it. Nothing really happened when we did. I mean, relations between the United States and Turkey did not like collapse overnight. Ru Turkey did not rush into the arms of uh, Russia um, overnight. Um, there, you know, the, the relationship between the two states, uh, United States and Turkey, is complex. Um, we still have relations, but um, you know. At least we finally better late than never, I guess. But it, you know, I'm glad we did it. It's not, it's not really a shining example of what you should do in this issue. But nonetheless, you know, I'm 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 glad we finally did we finally did do it. Yes. Now, of course, since Erdogan has come to the fore in Turkish politics, Westernization and secularization have really taken a nosedive. Right. Uh, and what I was wondering is, you know, in this generation of another sort of young Turk is traveling abroad much more than they used to. Aren't they questioned? Don't do they come back to Turkey saying, are we being told the truth about, about the genocide? Are they questioning? Are they challenging their government about this? 
there are a number of people who do, um, and there have been a number. And it's 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 funny because when Erdogan was first elected, um, there was great hope that Turkey would recognize the genocide precisely because he wasn't a secular modernist, right? The, the, the repression of the genocide and the denial had been such a, a, a mainstay of the nationalist military basically aligned parties that had been in power since the foundation of the Republic. That when Erdogan came in, there was at least a hope that here coming with someone with a more um, uh, Islamist bent, that this is the person who could actually admit that this had happened because he's not allied with what came before. Uh, unfortunately, that did not uh, turn out that way. Um, but there are a number of people within the Republic of Turkey who do know, who do say it's a genocide. I've met a number of them. Um, some of them have been forced to leave Turkey, can't go back um, because they know they'll be arrested. Uh, it's dangerous. It's, you know, insulting Turkishness is a law. In, in Turkey that you can go to jail for. And saying there was a genocide is insulting Turkishness. There have been very brave Turks who've come out. Somebody, they've published books about the Armenian genocide and you know, their, their publishing house was bombed, their offices were bombed. Um, so people still continue. There have also been this interesting um, movement of a lot of Turks finding out that their grandparents, one of their grandparents was Armenian because a number of women um, during the genocide had been taken and married off. Um, and nothing had been spoken about this in, in, you know, in their lives. And then all of a sudden they find out towards the end of their grandmother's life. And it's usually, and there was a famous book, My Grandmother is Armenian. Um, they find out um, uh, at the end of their lives, either they see a tattoo of a cross on, on their grandmother or their grandmother starts to speak a language that they don't know. And it turns out it's Armenian because they remember their childhood language. Or finally, they just say, yeah, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm Armenian, but I was, you know, married off to your grandfather when I was seven. And so I, that identity doesn't really exist for me anymore. So there's been a very interesting series of that happening, particularly, you know, particularly amongst the Kurdish population, um, where they've been more open now talking about either their Armenian roots or the Armenian past of a lot of uh, uh, Kurdish, where Kurds are now the, the primary inhabitants, um, and intermarriage between uh, Turks, uh, Kurds and, and Armenians. They've been more open about it, of course, because they also have their own um, argument against the Turkish government. And so they've looked to that. But it's been, it's been difficult more recently. There's been, again, a, a revival of even a harder crackdown on Armenian-related things in Turkey in the past few years. Yeah, uh, you touched on this. One of our students asks, is it true talking about or recognizing the Armenian genocide can be met with criminal punishment in Turkey? Yes, it can, it, it, it's, it's sort of strange because it's not, it's, not, it's, not met, it's not consistent, let's say. So for example, in the town of Diyarbakir, the Armenian, uh, the, sorry, the, the Kurdish mayor did acknowledge the Armenian genocide and they opened up an Armenian church, but then this was subsequently closed more recently by the by by the Turkish government, and 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 so in some places it seems to be that it may be possible, and in other places it uh, it isn't. There was a conference, um, you know, that talked about it. Uh, there, I have to say, they are, you know, they're not. Um, I would say crude in how they handle this issue. They try to handle it in the way that will attract the least amount of attention. Um, beyond Turkey. Uh, so yes, theoretically, and there have been people who have been jailed for insulting Turk Turkishness by talking about the Armenian genocide, but there have been other people who haven't been punished. So, if, and there is an Armenian member of the Turkish parliament right now, Garo Pailan, and, and he's, you know, he's come under threat. He's, uh, it's been dangerous for him, but he's still a member of parliament. Uh, yeah, that's a step forward. Uh, one of our audience members says, as someone who grew up getting Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day off from school and grew up in a community with a lot of Armenian peers, I am confused why it has been forgotten so easily and has only recently been recognized by, by the U.S. Isn't yeah, it a yeah. law in the state of California that the Armenian Genocide must be taught in our high schools? Yes. Yeah. And, it's, and, that, and this is an interesting like, development. I mean, there, and again, excellent question. How the Armenian genocide was forgotten um, 
I, it happened in the, I, I would, over the course of the Great Depression, as, as we moved into the Great Depression and World War II, and of course, America's narrative of World War II dominates our account of the 20th century. For us, World War I is much less of a significant marker than World War II. And World War II has sort of come down as like the ideal war, uh, the way we conceive of war. And unfortunately, in some ways, because it's actually one of the unusual wars in which there's like a clear bad guy um, that you can point to and say, okay, this has to be stopped and you need to do whatever you can to stop him. If you look historically, it's always been a little bit more confusing than that. And there aren't any good decisions or there are very few good decisions uh, that can be made. Uh, so part of it is how in the American mentality, World War II sort of superseded anything having to do with World War I. So that's one part of it. Um, the, other, the, the other part of it had really had to do with the efforts of the Turkish government to, um, uh, to really put pressure on people not to, um, not to talk about it, particularly officials, right? Not, I mean, obviously not on, the, you know, on a local level, but even when we built our genocide monument here, right? The Turkish consul got in touch with the CSU system <laughs> asking them to prohibit it. So, I mean, there, and, you know, it's, it is a major arm of their operation. Um, and um, they do spend a lot of time and effort lobbying politicians, um, putting pressure on companies, um, and, and um, paying. Uh, they started a number of Turkish positions in the United States at universities to combat anything that may be seen as um, putting forward uh, the Armenian genocide. Uh, so they put a lot of time, money, and effort into um, denying uh, the Armenian genocide. Now, the state of California has um, mandated that the Armenian genocide be taught in, in high schools, uh, and even uh, possibly even before. I forget where it starts, whether it's a junior high school or just high school. But even so, if I were there in person, I used to ask this when I'm there in person, say, how many of you learned about this in, 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 in high school? And you know, not usually only three people would put their hands up, despite the fact that it's mandated by the legislature. And and the part of the reason for this too has been the problem of getting teachers who are educated in it. Um, and the textbooks that are used aren't from California often. And since it's not mandated in other states to be taught, they don't norm, they may not include it in their textbooks. And up until the United States government acknowledged it textbook companies were afraid to call it. They would call it the alleged genocide, the so-called genocide, the, you know, the bad things that happened in World War I. And, and it would get like maybe a line or two. Um, and, and, and it's amazing how quickly historical memory is lost. Uh, and you know, this happens, you know, I see it now even, you know, I've had students come up to me and ask me what happened on 9-11 and that, to me is like, you know, earth shattering. You know, I was there, I witnessed it and now have someone say like, I'm not quite sure what happened is, you know, you can imagine we're now talking about over a century, um, how much gets lost. Uh, so, so part of it is just loss of historical memory. Part of it is an active um, wish on, 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 the, on, on, on the Turkish government to, to repress any, any sort of knowledge about this. Part of it is America's focus on World War II over World War I for our particular uh, circumstances. And then part of it was also that the survivors, and this is true not just of the Armenians, but of you know, other genocides, didn't wanna talk about it. If you survived the Armenian genocide, what you did when you came to the United States was not start going around saying, hey, I survived the genocide. You just got to work and tried to build a family and you didn't, and, and build a new life for yourself. And you didn't even tell your kids. Many people didn't know even like the children of the survivors didn't know what their parents went through until very late in life. And this sort of acknowledgement and awareness of what happened to their parents or grandparents started to come to the fore in the 60s and 70s in America amongst the Armenian community itself. And then it started to push greater. And of course, California was at the forefront of this in many respects with the first genocide monument in, in America, Montebello. Um, and, and then with what was happening in, 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 in is the connection to what was the Soviet Union. In 1988, there was a huge earthquake um, and also in which you know, 40,000 Armenians uh, were, were killed. And that 
sort of drew American attention to the Republic of Armenia, but at the same time, the protests over Nagorno-Karabakh and wanted Nagorno-Karabakh to be united to Armenia, and the Soviets uh, were pressing Armenian political movements um, at that time, also then put pressure on Ar American Armenians. As they said, here we have other Armenians willing to protest and speak up for Armenian issues in the Soviet Union where they're surrounded by tanks and they have military helicopters above, we in the United States are afraid to talk about our own history for no, without any, nobody's not making us do this. It's not that we're being surrounded by police or, or the military. We just haven't gotten our act together to do it. And so I think that also spurred a whole generation of Armenian activism to say like, hey, this is going, you know, this happened and we need to understand why we're here in America, what our trajectory has been, what happened in the past, and we need to have America acknowledge what happened to us and also continue to put pressure on Turkey to acknowledge what happened. Another member of our audience says, thank you for this excellent presentation. One small correction. It's the Black Sea and not the Caspian above the first provincial map presented. Oh, right. I, yeah, I, have, to, I, have, I have to, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank no, you, you know. <laughs> thank you. Yes, I have to fix that. I just have to get a new map for that one. I put it back in. I, yes. Here's another question: Do the Turks fear reparations if they recognize the genocide? Yes. Would it be possible to monetize reparations? You know, they. I don't. You know, they may claim it. I don't think it's as big a deal as. Um, as the psychological impact and the actual statement of what it means that the Turkish state has lied about this for so long. The reparations, I don't even know how they would handle them. Um, that would be complicated. It would be a long lawsuit regardless. You know, they could say something fine, we'll give you know, $50 million to the Republic of Armenia, here you go, or $100 million. Reparations have not really worked as a, they don't really do much um, in terms of any sort of real healing or uh, moving dialogue forward. I, I know, I mean, it's, it's tough to say. I don't think they're really, because I'm sure we, would, we could even like negotiate that. So it would wind up being the United States that paid the reparations through some sort of back channel where we buy we'd give them free military and aid instead or buy some of their stuff. And I don't think money's the issue. The money, the money can be found if they really wanna do that. I think the bigger issue is the legitimacy issue. That by acknowledging that this happened, you're delegitimizing the state because you have to acknowledge that part of the Republic of Turkey is founded upon a genocidal act and that it is built upon the wealth and the labor of a population that it that the Ottoman Empire exterminated, but that the subsequent state never acknowledged and instead it, um, took advantage of. Uh, and so I, I think that to them is a bigger fear than the money. Uh, and, and in many ways, I think the money would be terrible for Armenians in, in, in many respects. How would they even like decide who gets what? It, be, it would become, it would become um, a giant infight over who has who has the right to even like distribute that money. Should it be the Republic of Armenia? Should it be the ANCA? Should it be the church? Should it be you know political leaders in the diaspora? Who actually survived? Did you survive if you were in, if your family was Iranian and, and Iranian Armenian and didn't actually go through the genocide? Should you get anything? I don't. I mean, I, it's it's such a and and then it becomes a nasty question. And one you know, would it be nice if they? I mean, personally, I would just like to see them establish real ties with the Republic of Armenia and help out with the, you know, st stabilizing the Armenian presence where it is today and, you know, being open about their own history and securing a future for Nagorno-Karabakh. If they did those things, I think that's worth more than any money that could be, that could be offered. Sergio, we thank you once again. It is certainly the case that many, many students at Sonoma State know more about the Armenian genocide because of the lectures that you give here. And we hope you stay healthy and well and that you'll be back with us next year, hopefully in person. That would be great, Diana. And thank you, sure for, would. thank you for doing this lecture series. That's where they learn about it. It's, it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank we'll you so much. Sergio. Thank, you. Yeah, thank you for all your assistance. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care.